So for our final speaker, he will talk about the risky business of buyer risk assessment and COVID-19 pandemic local perspectives. Our speaker is recognized for his important contributions in the field of microbiology. He had an undergraduate degree in medical technology from Siliman University and a master's and PhD in microbiology from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, with subspecialization in molecular genetics from the Universidad de Leon, Spain. He received the citation for excellence in doctoral research from the area de microbiologia Universidad de Leon and the Department of Science and Technology PICA start outstanding dissertation in advanced science and technology for the for the characterizing the regulatory function of the homo aconitase gene in penicillium chrysogenum. He is currently working on the characterization of virulence genes in Ceratia marcensens, and he finished a training course in biotechnology and crop protection sponsored by UPLB and the International Rice Research Institute and attended several biosecurity training workshops sponsored by the Sandia National Laboratories of the U.S. Department of Energy and the U.S. State Department, as well as the Joint Defense Threat Reduction Agency of the U.S. Department of Defense, UPNIH Philippine Advanced Biorisk Officers Training Program. Let us all welcome our next speaker, Dr. Franco Tevez. Okay, Franco, maybe you can turn on your yes. video. Yes, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, before the presentation, I would like to greet everyone. Uh, good morning. And uh, just to inform you that uh, my presentation is pre-recorded. That is to minimize any uh, possible uh, glitch uh, due to instability in connect connectivity. Another thing is I would like to limit my talk to only 15 minutes and to simplify my presentation. So thank you. I hope you would uh, be able to uh, get the uh, meat of the presentation this morning. What I wish to share is how one university office can significantly help the surrounding community in times of a public health crisis, such as the current COVID-19 pandemic. Perhaps, not all universities have set up a biosafety or biorisk office. This short presentation will hopefully encourage all institutions to have one. To begin, let me recall with you a little bit of recent history of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is important to a biorisk officer based on published reports. I was tracking and monitoring the spread, but never really realized that it would become a pandemic in about two and a half months since Wuhan. It reached the Philippines on uh, January 30, 2020, and the first case in Mindanao was reported from my city on March 8, 2020. Thereafter, outbreaks were reported in several places in the Philippines. The objectives of this presentation are the following. One, to describe the role of the University Biorisk Office in times of public health crisis. As most eyes are upon medical doctors, nurses, and medical technologists in the fight against COVID-19, not known to many are biorisk officers in the background evaluating the risk posed by the novel coronavirus. Second, to demonstrate the applicability of laboratory biorisk management principles to field biorisk assessment. One who is grounded in laboratory biorisk management will not find it difficult to work in the field as in evaluating the risk of a pandemic. And third is to demonstrate the critical function of the university biorisk office in um, influencing policy, which for me is a game changing role of a biorisk officer. Any institution with an existing biorisk office and trained biorisk officers have an advantage 
thanks to the National Training Center for Biosafety and Biosecurity, which handles the Philippines Advanced Biorisk Officers Training or the PABOT program with the U.S. Department of Defense, Defense Threat Reduction Agency or DITRA, the Department of State, the Sandia National Labs, the UPNIH, the National Committee on Biosafety of the Philippines, the UNEP Biosafety Clearinghouse, and the American Biological Safety Association, which have provided invaluable inputs. MSU IIT Biorisk Office had a lot of preparations since January 2020. And until now, a lot of preparations, a lot of activities are ongoing. We need to, to learn a lot of things about the novel coronavirus. And so we had to look into published reports from the uh, website of the WHO, the uh, CDC, and uh, published articles, especially those in the New England Journal of Medicine. We also did a lot of review and study on international biosafety, biosecurity, and biocontainment principles. And we conducted several fora on COVID-19 because at the early stages, there was already a tendency for the public to panic. And so we figured out that there has to be a way to uh, give correct information regarding the COVID-19 uh, problem. Now, laboratory biorisk management principles are very, very important in the in, in our particular case now, and we just have to tweak some of the principles so that we can make use of this for a field biorisk assessment in this particular case for COVID-19. Biorisk management consists of three basic steps. One is biorisk assessment. This is followed by biorisk mitigation. And then the last is performance when we do all the mitigation uh, plans and uh, make this uh, you know, a reality. A review of the basic concepts is also very important. For example, what is a biohazard? It is any biological agent that possesses the potential to cause harm on humans, animals, and plants. Biorisk uh, consists of uh, two important components, the likelihood of infection and the consequence or uh, severity of uh, infection or exposure. And so we have the so-called risk equation as uh, can be seen in the slide. Now, laboratory biosafety consists of containment principles, technologies, and practices implemented to prevent unintentional exposure to pathogens and toxins or their unintentional release. This is from WHO. For example, it is believed uh, in the US, for example, that the COVID-19 is a, uh, um, you know, a um, biological agent that has escaped the Wuhan, uh, from the Wuhan um, Institute of Virology. If that is the case, there is unintentional release, and this is an example of a breach in biosafety protocols. Laboratory biosecurity, on the other hand, refers to the protection, control, and accountability for valuable biological materials within laboratories in order to prevent their unauthorized access, loss, theft, misuse, their version or intentional release, again from the WHO. The key words here are, on, are unauthorized access or intentional release. Then we have field biosecurity, which is quite different from lab biosecurity in the sense that the organisms we deal with may or may not be well characterized. Our work area may not have well-defined perimeters and our work procedures are very flexible to conform to very different and rapidly changing situation. Biocontainment refers to confinement of materials that are harmful or potentially harmful to life. 
So this harmful or potentially harmful materials consist of bacteria, fungi, viruses, toxins, and tissues. These are also called biological hazards or biohazards. Okay. As they are, they remain hazards unless someone is going to handle these uh, biological materials and in the handling, the process of handling, there is now a, a risk that is involved. There are two important goals why we did a bio-risk assessment, why we conducted this, not only for our university, but for the entire city. One is to inform management of the level of risk of viral transmission in the university and in the community. Second is to help the management decide on appropriate mitigating measures to reduce the risk. This is important because um, as, bio, as a bio-risk officer, um, he is actually, does, he does not have the authority to do the, I mean, to make the decision, but he or she can help the management make the decision through, you know, a very good risk assessment. So the methods that are used are standard methods in biosecurity risk assessment. We begin with hazard identification. And in this particular stage, we no longer have a problem because we know that the hazard we are dealing with is the novel coronavirus. First, it was referred to as a 2019 uh, novel coronavirus, then uh, referred to again as the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and then uh, more recently with the COVID-19 uh, virus. Then uh, once we identify the hazard, uh, what comes next is hazard characterization. And this really takes a lot of work because we have to read a lot of materials regarding the, um, the virus. Uh, for example, what are its characteristics, its route of um, uh, entry, um, in, its infectious dose, its incubation period and all the other characteristics of the virus. Once we have enough of this information, we move on to the next process, which is on risk characterization. And this particular stage, we now ask the questions, what is the likelihood of exposure to the virus? And what is the consequence of exposure? And then the result of this is what we call as a risk evaluation when we have the risk level uh, estimated. This is then uh, given as a report, and of course, with a uh, accompanying list of mitigation measures. If management considers the, the uh, level of risk as acceptable, then there's no other action needed. But if the management thinks that uh, the risk level is, is gray, I mean is high and needs to be reduced, and therefore, we have to be prepared to also um, propose some mitigation measures. In doing <clears throat> risk assessment, there are several methods. We can have a qualitative risk assessment. We can have also a semi-quantitative risk assessment. And then we have the quantitative risk assessment. So for a rapid uh, risk assessment, uh, we can make use of the semi-quantitative risk assessment protocol. And in doing so, we make use of a risk matrix, as can be seen on the slide. On the X axis and the Y axis, okay, so uh, on the Y axis, you have the likelihood, the likelihood of uh, occurrence of a particular um, adverse effect or event. And this ranges from uh, the descriptors used here are one, rare, unlikely, possible, likely, or almost certain. And uh, these are given numerical values from one to five. The descriptors used for consequences are insignificant, minor, moderate, major, and catastrophic. Also given uh, numerical values from one to five. And so if we now have a combination of the likelihood and the consequence, we would come up with a particular estimate of the risk from low risk to medium and high. We selected 10 uh, parameter, uh, risk parameters, such as uh, no so, I mean, uh, social distancing, the wearing of face mask, 
and then also including control of mobility across the city borders. And we uh, did our risk characterization and then our risk evaluation. And uh, if you can see here, all in all aspects, in all of these um, risk parameters that we have chosen, we have a high risk level. And so we made use also of a proposal for mitigation measures. We submitted this, the complete report was submitted to the LGU. Okay, so example, for, in, for example, how we compute for the risk. A uh, question that could be asked is, what is the risk of contracting COVID-19 in Iligan City with no social distancing, knowing that many COVID positives are asymptomatic? So we make use of the risk uh, equation, okay, which is equal to the likelihood, and we can multiply this with the consequence. So uh, for the likelihood, it is it would be like it would be likely to uh, you know exp I mean people to be exposed to the virus if so, uh, if social distancing is not uh, practiced, and the consequence uh, is you know is estimated to be a major consequence. And therefore, if we multiply the two, we now have four times four equals 16. And if we take a look again at the risk matrix, uh, the risk level is high or yeah. So as can be seen here. Now, the other important function of a bio-risk office and a bio-risk officer is on the uh, aspect of policy. So uh, it's very important. I would call this a game-changing role of the, the bio-risk officer because a policy is very important. It points direction of, of a course of action. And in doing so, for example, in our particular case, we, uh, because of our risk assessment, we incorporated this into our proposal, okay? Uh, proposed exit protocol upon expiration of the enhanced community quarantine or ECQ in Iligan on April 3, 30, 2020, and the possible transition to general community quarantine, or GCQ, uh, impinging on MSU, IIT, and other local institutions. So, um, roughly about 70 to 80 percent of our proposals were incorporated into the, uh, the, the policy, the guidelines from the city government. So, in conclusion, a university virus office is vital in times of public health crisis such as the current COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, the principles from laboratory bio-risk management can be applied for, for field bio-risk assessment. And that risk assessment results can be used to influence policy aimed at reducing the level of risk through appropriate mitigating measures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that presentation.